awesome. And just a reminder to folks, if you want to keep yourself muted when it's not um, your time to speak, um, and then definitely our participants off the call, if you want to stay muted, that will help us out. Uh, okay, so I should mute it now then, right? Yeah, that's good. That will work just perfectly. Go ahead and mute my phone so we don't have the serenade of email logins. Awesome. And again, for those who are just joining us, whether on Facebook uh, or on Zoom, we will get started at 525 in just a couple of minutes here with our presentation. You want to grab a coffee or I guess a tea maybe at this time of night um, and then come on back. We will get started shortly. But in the meantime, feel free to just hang out. All right, we will get started in just a moment. I'm just making sure that we've got our stream up. Perfect. All right, folks. Well, welcome. Um, we will be presenting for about an hour and a half tonight. Um, and we are expecting a few more folks to be jumping on the call. So we will give them some time to do that. But to start off with those of you who are here, um, I want to welcome you. My name is Ariel Hunter. I am the community outreach coordinator here at the Elkhorn Slough Reserve. Um, and this is one of our evenings at the estuary series which is a series of talks and presentations focused around this year, the theme of community action um, and taking action for conservation in our local communities. So we have heard thus far this year from folks who worked on um, the humble oil plant that was going in at the south of the slough and worked to fight that. We have heard from um, the stewardship team at the Elkhorn Slough Foundation talking about their work mapping the watershed and the vegetation specifically in our watershed. And tonight we'll be hearing from a panel of speakers who will be talking about native plant gardening um, and some general 
both basics for getting yourself involved in native plant gardening if you're new to it, um, as well as more in-depth topics like firescaping and looking at some of the um, online resources and horticultural resources for native plant gardening in this area in Monterey. Um, so we're glad to have you joining us tonight. A couple basic logistics for the evening. We will have um, four panel talks. Each talk will be between 15, 20 minutes long. Um, we will not be taking questions during those talks or in between those talks. So they will transition one after the other. But we do have my friend Lauren, who is our summer outreach intern, who will be in the chat looking for your questions. So as we go, if you have a question, please put it into the chat box if you're on Zoom, which you can find the little chat box icon at the bottom of the meeting screen. And if you are on Facebook or joining us from Facebook, you can find that um, that you can use the comment box at the bottom. I will be monitoring that for questions and comments as they go through. Lauren will be checking our Zoom chat and together we will hopefully be able to answer many of your questions or as many as we can when we reach the Q&A portion, which will be the last half hour of our two hour presentation tonight. Um, so feel free at any point in time, if you would like to get yourself a glass of water or a cup of tea, please go and do that. We want you to be comfortable. Um, just know that we are recording this and we are also um, streaming live to Facebook. So uh, if you want to turn your camera off, you can. Um, otherwise, we definitely recommend that you keep your camera off and we definitely ask that you keep yourself muted if you're on um, Zoom because it helps to decrease any background noise like typing. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, get us started for our evening. The last thing I realize I do wanna mention because it's written in big letters in front of me is we do have some really cool upcoming events here at the Elkhorn Slough Reserve. And we are slowly reopening our spaces and our programming um, and a couple of the things that, you, that are still open to drop into if you're interested are our upcoming Art Under the Oaks, which are two events. Um, they are the same event on August 6th and August 14th. So if you could only make one of those days, that's fine. Um, they're not paired together. They are both the same event repeated twice to increase capacity for folks who want to do it. And that will be a guided watercolor session in our oak forest. So we will take you on a little walk through our oak forest habitat um, where you can explore um, the, the habitat ecosystem there as well as um, paint. And we will be guiding you through a watercolor session. The other and maybe of more interest to this particular crowd of folks is our upcoming garden day. So we just launched these garden day last July. Uh, they are focused on a, getting people to help us with our thousand native plants that I'll be showing you in a moment that we planted last winter and caretaking the native gardens around the visitor center here at the reserve. Um, but they are also supposed to be learning opportunities. So we will be um, teaching on different subjects in native plant gardening at each of those garden days. The next one is August 21st and the focus is on seed collecting and propagating native plants from seed. So please come out. All of these events you can find at our website, elkhornslough.org, and all of these events do require RSVP due to physical distancing requirements. So make sure to drop me a line if you're planning to attend any of them. And with that, um, we are going to go ahead and start our evening. Tonight, we are talking about native plant gardening. And I wanted to start with the idea of why we plant or why we garden with natives anyway. So my native plant gardening experience is pretty uh, shallow, shall we say. It is a two inch rose pot, not a three gallon uh, tree pot. My native garden is comprised currently of four little plants that are probably desperately begging me every day to get into bigger pots, which I promise I will someday do. Um, I do not have a lot of native plants growing at my house right now, but I do help caretake 
a lot of the native plants that went into our new parking lot. So last summer, many of you know that here at the reserve, we actually demolished and rebuilt our parking lot. Um, we created a whole bunch of new garden beds and new green spaces for people to be able to plant into. And this concept of demolishing our parking lot and rebuilding it with more green spaces, we came up with that a couple years back. Um, and we did not know there would be a global pandemic when we went to go and dig into the ground, but it happened. And what that means is that when our parking lot was finished, here's what it looked like originally. We had a lot of um, sort of just invasive grassland space. Um, and then we had a couple of small gardens around the visitor center, but not terribly much. And when we remodeled it, or when we finished remodeling it, we now had tons of new garden space, hundreds of square acre or hundreds of square feet of planter beds to work in. And initially these planter beds were just dirt and a lot of gravel. And we were in the middle of a, our reserve being closed during the pandemic. We were also in the middle of trying to navigate shelter in place orders as they lifted and the different tiers um, that our county was in. And we had formally thought that we would have hundreds of people coming out to help us plant these garden beds. And suddenly we were only allowed to have like four. So our volunteers that volunteer here at the reserve really stepped up to the plate. Um, volunteers from just about every department came in to help us prepare these beds. Um, we were mulching in the hot sun of summer and then we were composting and then we were uh, tilling the soil and rototilling it so that it would be ready um, to plant good plants into. And then when uh, the fall hit and the winter hit, we went and planted it. And winter, of course, is when we went into shelter in place round two. So now instead of being allowed four volunteers at a time, we were allowed one volunteer at a time or one family unit. And so again, our team really stepped up to the plate. They came out in droves every day of the week. They were separated by time and space and we managed to plant a thousand native plants in a month in our new garden beds. And the fruit of all of their labor is in what those beds look like now. And I encourage all of you to come out to the reserve and see the new demonstration gardens as they begin to grow and form and evolve. Um, we have, like I said, over a thousand native plants that went in and most of them have survived. And we now have big teeming gardens and what I can say about native gardening is this year, all of this, creating this, tilling this and prepping this and then seeing it bloom, that has been my mental solace. And I know many of you are probably uh, experienced gardeners who already know that native gardening is amazing and wonderful for your mind, body and soul. Um, but those of you who are new to this, I really invite you to get engaged in it and find um, the enlightenment that comes with watching something grow that you built and then watching all of the wildlife that comes in as you grow that space. Um, and now, like I said, my native plant garden is not at my house. It's here at the Oak Corn Slough Reserve. Um, I spend an inordinate amount of time walking through our sensory garden, our pollinator garden, our demonstration gardens, and just enjoying the things that come in and associate. And I hope that after tonight's talk, you all will be able to pull either new thoughts or new design ideas away from this, or you, if you're that newbie gardener, will feel inspired to get more engaged with what we're doing. And with that, I am going to turn it over to our first speaker for the evening. Um, so our first speaker, Karen Lang, um, has been gardening in Santa Cruz with exclusively native plants since mid eighties. She also volunteers with the California Native Plant Society, which is where I found her, um, and is also a volunteer at the UCSC Arboretum. If you need, oh, and she is excited to jump in and come on today and talk about some of the basics of native plant gardening for those of you who are looking at how to get more involved in the garden. So with that, I would like to invite Karen to take over the mic here. 
Okay. Well, welcome everybody. And um, this is, um, my focus is on native plant gardening in a suburban or almost urban setting, which is actually kind of not very usual. Anyone who walks around their neighborhood who knows native plants would realize that they're not seeing a really lot. So that's why I got invited to be a presenter here because of my kind of un more unusual setting and, and garden. And also this is my first small garden. So it's been a really learning experience for me. So what we're looking at now is my front yard in how it looked before my, a recent mound in the front. And as you can see, there's um, three colors of native California poppies here in the front. There's like a white selection, a yellow one, and the more inland selection that's orange. And behind that is my only large shrubs. And I'm gonna talk more about that too. The first one you can see is a silk tassel or Maria elliptica, which is a little more unusual. And then right behind that is a coffee berry, which is a very wonderful, tolerant, easier to grow plant. And then if you look just to the right of the silk tassel, you'll see some little branches sticking out. And that's a coyote bush, which people rarely ever have in their garden, but I particularly love them. And I'm going to talk a little more about those because they are very tolerant and fast growing. And so just some general comments about starting native plant gardening. Dive in with courage. Just be brave and go for it. And to start, look at the sun and shade uh, that you have in your area, in your space that you're going to plant. And also think about the slope and drainage issues because our California plants, most of them want very good drainage. And that can be a really a real challenge. Like where I live on the lower west side of Santa Cruz, there's, I was shocked at the poor drainage in my place. And I should have had a clue because my house and all my neighbors have one to three sump pumps. And that gives you a little clue about drainage. And you also want to look at what kind of soil do you have? Is it like a really heavy clay, like you could build an adobe house out of it? Is it really sandy or is it more of a mixed kind of more gardeny type soil? So just, just start. And I would recommend, as I remember clearly when I started, just expect some of the plants will not survive. It's not your fault, it's a learning experience. And remember, you probably only paid about the same as two lattes for a plant. And if it dies, you just learn and move on. And um, it's very good to get help and advice. And a really great place to get a lot of excellent free advice is at the California Native Plant Society, our Santa Cruz chapters plant sale where helpful people like me are standing around waiting to give you advice on where you live and what plants might work for you. And it's a lot of fun. And our sale is gonna be October 16th up at the UCSC Arboretum, a little plug there. And um, another really wonderful thing to do, and once again, a plug is to join the California Native Plant Society, which has incredible, incredible resources and marvelous publications that can really, really help. Um, so, so yes, looking at those things, sun and drainage, soils, and this. And then one just little tiny tidbit is I don't recommend drip systems for native plant gardens. Maybe some people like them. I haven't found it helpful because each plant tends to need different kind of watering and it's much better just to have a sprinkler or do hand watering. I'll just toss that in right now. So let's go to number two. Slide. Okay, so here's another shot of my front garden in another 
time from the first one. And this is another benefit of the Native Plant Society. You can get these wonderful signs that say native plants live here. And a garden like mine, where a lot of people walk by on the sidewalk, it's a real learning, learning experience. And the plants you can see here in this picture are um, in the foreground, there's a white monkey flower there. I, um, and um, blue-eyed grass, Scissorinchium. I'm blanking out kind of because it's a little stressful for me. Front, anyway, blue-eyed grass. And then the white monkey flower that's in the foreground there is an arboretum selection called Ozma. And then in the background is some other colors of monkey flowers. I kind of I have a lot of monkey flowers, I, as you'll see on my slides. I really like them. And um, so that's more of that. So we can move on to number three. This is my very first mound when I realized how really poor the drainage was at my house. And this is right along my driveway. And you can see my neighbor's cars in the back and you can see how urban and you know, cottagey and there's just rows of houses in my neighborhood. And so what is here is on the left in the front, the purple bluish flower is Douglas iris, iris douglasiana, which is a wonderful plant and definitely one of my real favorites. And then there's the next plant, which is kind of, you can, it's kind of small and you can see some yellow, little yellow blossoms, is our coastal variety of the California native poppy, which is a lower growing one with a more grayish foliage and yellow flowers with the little orange center. And then right next to that is the standard, more standard orange California poppy, which is actually a more inland variety. And then in the background is on the left is a much bigger monkey flower, a kind of an orangey, beautiful kind of selection. Again, I think that was from the Arboretum. And then I have some other more special plants like the taller one that's kind of spiky sticking up there in front of my neighbor's car. It's actually, it's a woolly blue curls. And um, they're, Probably not for the beginner. They're a little fussier, but naturally I fell in love with them. And they're one of my favorite plants and they're hard to grow. And if they don't like where they are, they just like die. But what can I say? <laughs> there it is. And then down front is a few more poppies and monkey flowers. But anyway, this is an example of a bed. And then I have in the front, right along the cement of the driveway, I have a strip where I put down weed cloth and I put really pretty pebbles in that front area. And I highly suggest this kind of thing in your more urban-y garden so your neighbors don't freak out and think it's a big mess is to have the edge like decorated kind of or made extra nice with pebbles and rocks or chunks of wood or something. And then I tend to keep mine kind of more pruned and swept up so it looks civilized so that people don't freak out and go, oh my God, that native plant garden, that just looks like nothing, you know, give me lawn. Okay, so let's go on to the next one. So here's some more of the um, first, more of my first mound with some monkey flowers. And there you see a really good picture of the woolly blue curls. And that's, like I said, a little fussier. And then in the background, the strip of white back there is a native bulb and it's, um, Tritillaea pedicularis or long ray bro brodia. And that again is a little bit more of a specialty when you start moving into the native bulbs. But you know, as you go through the years and you become more knowledgeable and then you realize what you really love, you know, things kind of change. And you can see I have stepping stones too in there because you want to always have access. 
Okay, let's go on to the next slide. Here's a another shot of some of my, a very lovely thing. It's blue-eyed grass in the front, which when it blooms, it's, it's very, you, Sometimes some of them are taller, but a lot of them are quite short. So they're good for small spaces. You can also grow them in containers. And when they bloom in their deep blues, it's, it truly is like a showstopper. And then behind that is a white selection of California poppy, which just like self-seeded itself in there and it popped up and it just made a knockout combination. I was really happy about that. Okay, so let's go on to the next one. Another really great plant for starting off in native plant gardening is our Iris Douglasiana again. And this is a selection called Canyon Snow that's very sturdy and wonderful. Um, our California Native Plant Societies, we always sell this selection because it's so successful and, and beautiful. And this is one of the two plants that started me off in the mid 80s with California Native Plants because I just happened to get some of this and I fell in love. And there, there it is. So let's go on to the next one. Uh, yes, maybe I'm going a little faster than I thought, but we'll see. I don't know. You're so okay, here, Carol. You're doing, or Karen, you're doing great. Okay, so here is a medium to bigger kind of shrub in the background, and this is a Salvia Clevelandi selection called Whirly Blue, which is actually a hybrid of Salvia Clevelandi and another Salvia but it's a very popular native plant, garden plant, because it blooms for a long, long period of time. And it does like good drainage, but it's not real, real fussy. And let me tell you, the native bees and the bumblebees and the hummingbirds adore this plant. So it's really fun to have in your garden because there's always a lot of activity around it. Like you can just stand there and the hummingbirds will be within two or three feet of you while they're feeding and lots of different pollinators. So it's, it's really exciting. And in front of that is an annual and it's Clarkia. And this I've bought various times from here and there, like Annie's annual sells it. You can get it there. You can get seeds. And this actually self-seeded itself into the garden, which is always a wonderful you know, like surprise an event. So I'm not quite sure if it's actually the completely species, which is um, Clarkia ammonia, but it looks like that Clarkia. Clarkia is called Farewell to Spring. So it blooms a little later than a lot of other plants. So it's very encouraging when your other plants are drying out and they don't look so great. There is the Clarkia looking spectacular and kind of filling in. And it's a, and also the pollinators love it. So that is a very, a very happy thing to have in between other plants, you know, in your garden. Okay, well, let's look at my eighth and last slide. This is my backyard. It's very small. And this is my newest mound. And it's all filled with monkey flowers that were in the salvage, almost dead giveaways at the Arboretum Nursery where I've been a volunteer in the past. And these plants were like all in one gallon pots and they were like little sticks with a few tiny leaves. I mean, they looked like hopeless, but I just, I just couldn't see them die. So I brought them home and they used to line my driveway, which I called my ICU. And then I did this new mound in my backyard because my grandson grew a sandbox and just put them in the ground. And they just grew in one year into these giant, beautiful plants. I just couldn't believe it. And they've they've got pollinators, little bees and bumblebees on them a lot, 
hummingbirds come in and, and there they are. Oh, one other thing about mounds. I highly, I do highly recommend them if you have any, any idea that maybe the drainage isn't good at your place. But when you're making a new mound, be sure and put gopher wire under it. You will be glad if you do. You'll save yourself a lot of grief. <laughs> and that's the time to do it when you're just putting, you know, building one. And I do the edging of my mounds with big rocks to kind of hold the soil because my mounds aren't very tall. They're only about maybe two feet or a little less even. And just getting the crowns of these plants up out of the less well-drained soil, even with just that small elevation, it's, it's quite helpful. And they're much, much happier. Um, so that's kind of, let me see if there was any other big hints. I have a list of um, plants that I really like that I think we could probably have on our resources, right? After this. Absolutely. Oh, and let me just, if I have a few more minutes, let me talk about coyote bushes. Go ahead. If you have a difficult space, and you'd like a larger shrub for privacy or whatever, think about a coyote bush. And these are, they grow everywhere as weeds. And I got permission to dig up a couple in the past from the back of the arboretum that's just kind of not developed. And they said, sure, take all you want. And they're currently growing in my backyard. And in one month, they're up to almost four feet. And they were just little things like this, little weedy little babies. And the one I have in my front yard, I've pruned so that you can see the, the trunks. It's a, it's a multi-trunk shrub. As the trunks come up, I cut away a lot of the extra little stuff so you could see the structure. And I do prune it to keep it under control so it can live in a you know tiny little front yard. But again, the native pollinators adore it. And the birds love to go first into the coyote bush and then into my bird feeder because they feel safe in there. So like I said, if you have a difficult place, other things have died, you're in despair, you can't get anything to grow there. Think about that. You can also get them at Central Coast Wilds Nursery that it will probably be in our information somewhere here in Santa Cruz. They actually have them too. Yes. But you can get them for free. Um, I think, I hope, do I need to, say more or is that yeah, pretty good? That's, that's fantastic Karen thank you and I really do I like that you highlighted that you know so much uh not so much necessarily but a lot of your plants came from you know places where they were they were salvaged um and you know a note on that you definitely always have to talk to people before you take them um don't wander out to the Elkhorn Slough Reserve yeah and yeah. collect stuff but curating or or um, networking with native plant places like the reserve and like the UCSC Arboretum, like the California Native Plant Society will help you find those niches where you can go and you know find your hookup for getting native plants. And I myself just got one, two of them that were very scraggly. They were from the leftovers pile, oftentimes nurseries. If one of them's not, if the plant isn't looking really good and sellable they'll put it on discount and so i just i got some beautiful plants that are now beautiful um for really really cheap for the price of only one latte um yeah, and so right. <laughs> curating those partnerships finding that network and building that network is a great idea and we do have to karen's um point we do have lots of resources that we'll be sharing with you mm -hmm. at the end of the night and in follow-up on all of the chats here so thank you so much for bringing um, your urban garden uh, to the foreground here to start us off, Karen. All right. Thank you. Absolutely. So be brave and go for it. <laughs> I love that. Dive in with bravery and confidence. Yeah. Um, with that, I would like to uh, alternate to our next speaker, 
Jackie Pasco. Um, Jackie moved from a suburb of San Jose, so that urban garden face, um, sort of urban garden face, to a ridge top in Santa Cruz County over 20 years ago. She was amazed by the piece of natural world that was now under her care and at the close knit community of neighbors who all jointly maintain their private road and the water system they rely on. Um, she is an active member of the California Native Plant Society and the chapter here in Santa Cruz and enjoys propagating her local native plants. And these days, fire and firescaping up there in the Santa Cruz mountains are always on her mind. And that will be part of what she speaks to us about tonight as she presents on gardening at the Wildlands Interface. So Jackie, I invite you to come off of mute and share your screen with us. Thanks, Ariel, and thank you, Karen. That was just lovely. You have such a beautiful garden and I've seen it grow over the years and evolve. It's uh, really nice. Um, when you garden in a wildland, it's a different situation. And um, I will talk about that uh, both in terms of the environment and also firescaping. So, um, but you can take uh, an environmental approach to gardening in the suburbs as well. You have choices in the suburbs. In the wildlands, you, you kind of, <clears throat> I, feel that, I feel a bit restricted, but I don't worry about that because I love it and I don't feel restricted. I feel blessed. So I'm going to share my screen and uh, share my slides. Is that working? Oh, here we go. Press the share button. Okay, so now hopefully yeah. you can see my, uh, my title slide. I can. So one thing about living, you can see it? Good. Okay, great. The one thing about um, living up in the wild lands is you get to see the most amazing things you would never expect. And uh, what we see in the corner of this first slide is an oak moth, oak moth caterpillar sunbow. And it was my grandson that noticed it. Um, just the way the sun was shining oak trees and the oak moths were all, all the caterpillars come down because that's what they do. They, they hatch out and they come down to the ground and they um, bury themselves in the ground and pupate. And with the sun catching it, it was just an astonishing effect. So I enjoy that for my first slide. Now then. So they call it the WUI, the Wildland Urban Interface, but I don't see any town near where I live. Um, the view out from, from where I'm sitting right now is all the way to the bay and it's mostly trees all the way but there are lawns up here in the in the wildland so the top i think i'll be able to cover tonight hopefully are about stewarding this wildland so that um you know there's not that much left in the big picture we feel like we have a lot because look <laughs> look all around us but in the big picture we're losing our wildland um you know, hand over fist. The seed that you see in the down there is um, Epilobium canum seed. It's a uh, California fuchsia. And um, they grow here wild and I propagate them. And then I plant them in the garden. So I have more um, florific display and hummingbirds love those. The thing about living in the wildland and, and gardening there is how everything is interconnected and you really feel it. You know, we know it, but you really feel it. And uh, I have a quote there by John Muir, who is also Scottish like me, but oh, hopefully I have better um, attitudes to indigenous people than he did. Um, but still, he did say, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. And I just love that quote. So when we live in the wildlands, I like to take a stewarding attitude rather than an ownership attitude. Um, my boundary lines are, we actually, we mostly don't exactly know up here where our boundary lines are. Um, and there are a lot of things that cross boundary lines like our water system, for one thing, and our road runs right through um, my property lines. And also, um, 
I like to look after nature. So I prioritize nature, I limit the areas that we alter a lot for our benefit. Although we do have a swimming pool that was here when we arrived here. Um, and my grandkids love it. We have an extended family here. So grandkids and turn husband and husband, my husband all live here. So just be amazed. If you're living in the wild land and you're not amazed, then uh, you, I'll, I'll give you a shake. It, you just be amazed at everything. And uh, above the ground, below the ground, in the sky. And if you are not gobsmacked, I suggest you read these people. Uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer, who is a uh, indigenous uh, American and a professor of biology. And she wrote um, Braiding Sweetgrass, which is a fantastic book uh, that brings indigenous viewpoints to the fore and scientific biology from that bi biology professor viewpoint. Suzanne Simard, who discovered that trees are, are talking to each other through their mycorrhizae, and she is a forester and a professor. Uh, Douglas Tallamy, who is an entomologist and who is encouraging everybody in the suburbs all across America to grow their local natives and make corridors so that isolated um, populations of insects and birds can move and uh, form better gene pools and survive. And um, Merlin Sheldrake, I love that name, but, and he's British, but he wrote this great book on fungus called Entangled Life. And it's a wonderful book and it's quite, quite amusing and lighthearted and very informative. So, um, so taking that stewarding attitude forward with us, let's go ahead. Oh, I need to have my cursor down here. So here are some of the fun things I see around my, my, my uh, property. Um, bunnies nibbling on the bunch grasses. Uh, chipmunks nibbling on the flowers of the um, miner's lettuce. They only eat the flowers. And bush tits, which everybody might see bush tits. I just love them. They come through in little flocks. The bush tits eating our local manzanita. And the, uh, the caterpillars are um, northern checker spot butterfly caterpillars. And they, they came in. One year we had tons of them. And they ate all the... Um, um, uh, sorry, I'm having a name, blank. I'll just keep going. They ate all of those things you see in the picture um, and they really never came back and it was just so sad. But so if you get caterpillars on your plants, it's good to leave them if you can because the birds need them to feed their babies. And then we have our fence lizard. Who cannot like the fence lizard? And I recommend you sing to your fence lizards because they like it and they'll stop and listen. <laughs> um, we have all kinds of native bees, the little... Okay. I was just informed that meeting is being recorded. Um, all kinds of bees. If you stand in front of the Ceanothus bush, you will see more kinds of bees than you ever imagined existed, which is great. Then there's other critters like bats, little bats, and they fly around in the evening. And that big snake there is not a rattlesnake, it's a gopher snake. And they're very good because we want to keep our gophers under control. And the other lizard there is the other one I see around here, which is an alligator lizard. And they're very shy and I don't often see them. So it was fun to see this guy popping out there. He's about six inches, eight inches long. Of course, we have deer browsing our plants. And I don't have a huge problem with that usually. Occasionally, I get a bit annoyed at them, but I like to see them. And of course, we have our iconic uh, uh, slugs. I'm name blanking again, sorry. Banana slugs and uh, bunnies. The bunnies actually eat a lot of weeds, so they're good. And then we have other critters that you might get a little scared by. The one on the left is a rain beetle, and they're cool. They just come out like for a few days each year, mate, and that's it. They're done. But they've been living underground for a long time. And the one in the middle, I call them crickety things because I don't know my insects terribly well yet. And then there are centipedes and millipedes, all kinds. So when we garden in the wild, I'm going to come to my main point right now that it I, I'm evangelical about the like it's don't pee in the gene pool. 
keep the gene pool for the local natives. You still have a lot of latitude in what you can put in the garden. If you like roses, if you like dahlias, keep them near your house in your personal garden space and enjoy them there. But um, try and not plant things that are gonna um, hybridize with your local natives. For example, Karen in the suburbs can enjoy those gorgeous monkey flowers because um, they're all um, horticulturally bred to be beautiful. Um, some of them might be called the jelly bean varieties and they, they, hide, they put them together and they come up with beautiful colors. Um, but, um, and I did that once when I was learning ropes and then I noticed that my local wild ones were coming up in funny colors too. And I didn't want to spoil the gene pool. It's very important because we have a lot of biodiversity in those local natives that can make them resilient to climate change. Um, they can evolve pretty rapidly if they're, you know, if they don't, if their generations come, you know, they're just plants rather than trees. <clears throat> and they can evolve pretty rapidly and adapt to changing climate conditions if we let them. The other thing I do is I remove weeds. I remove the things that get in the way. And there are some weeds you just kind of live with and, and you get rid of them a bit and they'll just kind of, they're hard to get rid of. Um, and then there's the really, there's the, the really bad ones like broom. Fortunately, I don't have any. I also don't have acacia. I do have a couple of eucalyptus trees that are enormous, but they're kind of way over there. Then there's other things that we find around our area like vinca, ivy, sticky eupatorium, which is a garden escaped plant that um, you might recognize it if you saw it. Um, and stinkwort, which is a recent invasive, and I have a personal campaign against stinkwort in my neighborhood, and we are keeping it out. Um, it's a, it's a, an annual plant that um, can really take over meadows. Um, and the non-native grasses, um, those aren't such a problem for me, I find. Um, if I just keep on top of them, the, the annuals, then I, I can pretty much eliminate them. There are other grasses that are harder, like the panic grass. Um, they're, they're perennial grasses, and they um, propagate by stolons and roots and every, every which way. So. The other thing to know about gardening, if you have a larger property, my property is just under three acres. It's not considered very big around here. It's one of the smaller ones but you will need help. Um, you can't do it on your own. I do a lot on my own. I did more when I was a little bit younger, um, but I still have to get um, some guys in there and then to do some of the heavy lifting or the bigger tasks. Um, so the, the plant on the right, um, I took that picture today. Those are some little local heuchera, like a coral bell, and I'm propagating them for my shadier north side of the property and um, I, I just gather the seeds of the ones from around here. Or we have a dirt road not far away and I gather plants from the edge of that dirt road. I think that's perfectly fine. Um, and then I can gather from other people's properties and I get their permission. Um, but as um, Ariel said, don't go into the, um, the native parks, uh, the public parks and preserves because it's usually not legal to gather things there. But you know, there's nooks and crannies, I'm sure, where you can get things. Okay, there's mine. I'm not moving. Ah. What's so special about native plants? I hear people say, but it's been here for hundreds of years, isn't it native yet? And that's really not the, no. <laughs> native plants are plants that evolved here. And they co-evolved and they co-evolved with insects and they co-evolved with their grazers and their predators and uh, each other. And that makes them just a really complex web. Um, the invasives come in, they're not part of that web. And so they can often outcompete because they have no natural enemies. So it's all very interesting and I love all that stuff. Um, and as I say, evolution's still going on. And even in stable environments with, with invasive, just reading in our latest CNPS journal issue, um, uh, it's now called Artemisia, that um, 
that if you have just one invasive and one uh, with a population of native plants, they are kind of starting to co evolve a little bit. But where you have a big mixture, uh, it doesn't happen. So here's what I was saying about horticultural values and ecological values. And I think we've talked about this. Um, so I won't, I won't say anything. The picture, the background on the left, we took at the Arboretum, one of the wonderful, colorful um, Mediterranean selections from uh, probably South Africa or Australia. And on the right, we have um, redwood sorrel, which was growing in my property. So some tips. Um, you don't really need to interfere a lot if you're gardening in the wildlands. You've got native soil. It doesn't need a lot. It doesn't want to be rich. The native plants evolved in the soil and they can grow there. Bees like some native soil. And um, another thing is to try and time your, your brush and tree work around the breeding season, um, the bird nesting season, because our birds, are, we don't have so many anymore by a long chop, and nor do we have the insects. Um, so give them a chance if can, um, and do it uh, in the fall and in the late winter or, you know, like that. It's not always possible and there are some places where I do a bit of cutting back, but another thing that's helpful in any uh, native plant garden is uh, you can extend, artificially extend your winter and make it wetter than it is by irrigating. And native plants love that. And they'll do better in the summer if you give them winter water. And some of them like some deep watering once a month. I tend not to do that. I tend to wander around with the hose. I'm not very good actually at irrigation. And thankfully most of my plants get by uh, fairly well. But it's a good idea for fire skating, fire skating to keep your plants um, hydrated. Uh, we're going to talk about resources. Someone else is going to do a great presentation, um, Patrick, about finding local natives to grow. So on to firescaping. The picture is one I took last weekend up on that dirt road I was telling you about, which is an access road um, for us to evacuate from one of two or three routes by which we can get. And the neighborhood got together and did some clearing. Um, so you can only control the fuel. And that really is, it kind of breaks my heart, but I have to do it. It means I have to cut back a lot of my natives and space them out. Um, but the most important place to do your firescaping is near the house. We, we, we probably all know about defensible zones, right? The new zone is the zero to five foot zone where you have nothing. You have only mineral stuff, concrete, pavers, gravel, nothing, no plants, nothing up against the house. And nobody's really doing it yet, I think, but they're really, really emphasizing it. Uh, Cal Fire, everybody's emphasizing um, that this is very important to make your home defensible. And uh, then, <clears throat> then the next zone is, is close to your home. And there you keep it, uh, basically they call it uh, lean, 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 clean and green, I think is the whole thing, low and spaced and irrigated, you know, you, you don't want um, fire embers to come in and catch fire. So, um, and then hardening your home, I'm not gonna cover that obviously, but that's really important. That's where embers ignite your home because you've prepared it correctly. My home is toast, I have to tell you. Then we get out more into the wildland areas and you have to reduce your escape vegetation by about 50%, which is really sad for me to do because I have a nice, in, was intact chaparral on one side, and I love the chaparral. And then you can read elsewhere about how to space out and avoid fire ladders by creating vertical space, as well as horizontal space between your plant groupings. You're learning more and more about how indigenous peoples used fire and also cared for the land. And that's very interesting to me as well. And I recommend that you look into it yourself. Um, they not only burned, but uh, they extended the California prairie lands, which were very productive for them for food. 
and they and they tended them, they tilled them, and they planted seeds, and um, that's why we had a lot of open space when the first Europeans came, um, and they wanted to open to, so they could see the bears and so they could um, shoot. Um, they, didn't shoot but they shot, they killed the deer and so forth. Anyway, so here's a picture that I is a scary picture. This was my uh, south-facing chaparral a while ago. It's definitely not fire safe. So I always tell myself, keep calm and drink tea. This is my garden, garden ornament. And here it is with some um, clearing done. It's not enough, but you know, you can take it in stages. And it's better for the environment if you do. And uh, you can focus on certain very flammable plants like shoes. Um, and uh, sage, the black sage, and, but you still have to work on getting it done. Or you can have a maintenance-free fire-resistant garden that consists of fake grass, fake rocks, and effervescent oil. This is a picture I took not that long ago of a garden done along the ocean. <laughs> anyway, it's not what I would want. Uh, good things to know about natives, they'll hydrate with less water and retain it than non-natives. And that hydrated wood really doesn't burn all that easily. And I think we've talked about that. You can increase fire resistance by knowing the characteristics of plants. It's better to know the characteristics of your plants than, the, the, than go by lists. The lists are all different from each other. And um, I, I was in a firescaping class recently um, by Monterey Bay Community College. It was a really good class. And one of the speakers was Douglas Kent, who wrote the book Firescaping. I don't know if I put this up, if you can see it. It's on the list. I just wanted to skip you. It's an excellent, excellent book. And he does give some, um, you know, he, he talks about the, the landscape and the native plants and uh, uh, the e ecosystem and so forth. So the condition of the plants is more important than the species, but there are certain characteristics that make plants more, um, more fire resistant. On the left, we see a nice juicy young coffee berry stem with nice green leaves. And so um, this, this slide shows you some uh, characteristics of plants that are useful. One thing I learned at that landscaping course was that plants that are gray or silver have a, a mineral in them that makes them fire resistant, which is great because um, I like some of those things. I have an island bush poppy out there and it's got beautiful yellow poppy flowers almost year round. And I was really worried that it was very fire hazardous, but it's apparently those gray leaves. Of course, it does need pruning. Evergreen plants are good. Of course, succulent plants are more fire resistant. Um, plants with open form or plants that are low and dense. And basically you avoid all the fine twiggy stuff like tinder, just think tinder, avoid tinder. Um, I, I attended a, a CNPS presentation by Nikki Hansen, who's a landscape uh, designer, I think over the hill. And uh, uh, these are some of her favorite virtues noted local natives, um, you know, when they're placed and maintained. And on the right, you see a small coast live oak that we were pruning up. Those things grow fast and you have to keep after them too. I think there's uh, several oaks down that way now. That's the same southern exposure that you saw. Uh, local natives for the 30 uh, zone, the close-in zone, you, there's lots of perennials to choose from. Um, bulbs and you can have pot plants. Pots with bulbs in work a lot better. And you can have, you know, your non-native plants there that you like. Um, you know, you can have choice there as long as it doesn't escape the wild or hybridize with the local natives. I'm good with that. You know, I like some things. We're probably going to put some dahlias in our only fenced bit of the garden because the deer eat there. Um, so here are some things that are really cool. I have a lot of uh, bunch grasses that are native to um, my property. 
and I propagate those and grow them. You just have to cut them down before it becomes fire season and they work really well. Lots of gorgeous local native. Um, this is a, a recent picture. So there's the chaparral slope that you saw and then there's the flat part where they cut the top of the ridge off to put the house on it. And they shoved all that over on the north side, which was kind of ruined, but um, nature is resilient. So what we see here is the buckwheats, and the most of the buckwheats you see are uh, naked buckwheat, which is a local wild species that I propagate and love in my garden. They have a beautiful form, and the grape pollinators. And there's a little bit of elegant madia, the yellow, the yellow daisy looking flower, which is kind of a weedy plant, but I like it. It's big and sticky, but it has these lovely yellow daisies. And in the background there, there's a not, a not local um, areogonum or buckwheat, which is Channel Island buckwheat, areogonum arborescent, which is just a gorgeous garden plant, and it behaves itself, and um, I like it, and uh, so do the pollinators. So my last slide really is after fire. After fire is uh, a lot, many people have experienced didn't have fire here. And we didn't get evacuated, we were next, you know. Scotts Valley is that way to us, and we're across the continuum from Scotts Valley. Um, we didn't get evacuated in, in the last fire. But the important thing is that nature is resilient. California nature knows what to do after a fire. And one of the best things you can do is nothing. I'm not saying you should always do nothing, but you should get advice before you do something after a fire. Um, and then you get different plants coming up. And some of those plants are ones that you can um, grow as um, plants in your garden because they're generally um, the perennials and um, short-lived plants that are not so woody. And then there's this thing called you know, succession where after they pioneer plants have come in. Then you might get coyote bush, which I agree with Karen is a wonderful plant. It grows all over here and I have to keep, keep it down but I let it grow where I can because it's green all year round. It's, if you keep it hydrated, it's fairly fire resistant. You can prune it. The, in, the, the wildlife loves it. It's got a huge benefit to insects. So I, I think it's great um, also. Um, there, so you can do things bad or you can wait and get advice. So um, the seed bank will regenerate. It might take a while, but it's worth waiting and watching for that. And um, you can read the CNPS Fire Recovery Guide. I put that in a list of resources that I sent to uh, Al Consley, name blank. Ariel, thank you. Um, and there are things like, there's this thing called Santa Cruz Erosion Control Mix, which is like a really good thing. But just Google it. Everyone says, don't get it, don't do it. I don't even know if they sell it anymore, but it seems to be a thing. And I know one of my neighbors put it in and I see the consequences and they're just not good. It just looks like weedy, non-native grasses. And, um, so just have to take care. And I don't have a closing slide, that's it. So I am all done and I hope that you enjoyed the tour and I probably forgot to say a few things, but, um, oh, go on hikes. If you want to learn your local natives, go on wildlife hikes or native plant hikes CNPS puts on some hikes um, and uh, we go to Henry Cowell and to places you might not normally go and, and uh, be prepared to walk very, very slowly because we love plants. <laughs> We're always bobbing down to look at things and, and go, oh, how did you see this one? <laughs> oh, so I agree. More a botanist. <laughs> yeah. I think the, uh, the longest, shortest hike I ever took was also one of the best I've ever taken was at Fort Ord with a botanist and we went less mile in four hours. Uh, <laughs> but I learned so much. Um, and that's actually a fantastic segue. Thank you, Jackie. Um, that idea of going out and exploring your local areas to understand um, which, uh, which plant communities are around you is actually um, part of the topic of our next speaker. 
Um, so with that, I would like to invite Jackie, if you want to stop screen sharing um, Ooh, up at the top there. The reminder. <laughs> and I would like to uh, welcome Carol Nickbard, who is um, actually an Elkhorn Slough volunteer. So the next time you're out here at the reserve um, and you're admiring the garden spaces, she's responsible for keeping them pruned and controlled. And I have certainly put in lots of future work for her out here with our thousand plants. Um, she is also a master gardener and a pruner and landscaper consultant um, who easily gets lost time out watching and listening to nature. So I'm going to invite you, Carol, to go ahead and share your screen with us. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Yep. You sound okay. clear. Awesome. All right. Well, first off, um, thank you, Ariel, for inviting me. Uh, this is a real treat for me to be part of this panel. So um, very much appreciate it. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about plant communities and borrowing from them um, and using them um, as models for our own gardens. And so uh, collectively, Monterey, Santa Cruz, and San Benito counties reach from the coast um, to the mountains and uh, to interior valleys. And plant communities help us make sense of the different physical arrangements of plants found in the wild, recognize the geological and climatic conditions where these arrangements of plants thrive. And then together, um, these can give us a head start in successfully matching local native plants to the features and conditions in our gardens. So um, another way to put it would just be, uh, we can compare um, what's going on in our gardens in terms of uh, geology, topography, sun exposure, wind, uh, nearness to the coast or whether we're inland. And uh, if we can find plants in comparable conditions, those would be good candidates for um, our gardens uh, for native plants. All right, so making sense of vegetation. Uh, vegetation Carol, can form- Just real quick. Yeah. I think, yeah. Um, you may need to go ahead and share screen again. Okay. Let me- um, Shoot, hang on, sorry. No, no problem. Uh, all right, let me share screen again. I'm getting a very, oh, hang on a second. Okay, this is the problem I'm running into. It's uh, balking at me because it wants me to select the screen and the problem is it's not giving me screens to choose from to select. Oh, well that's new and different. Uh, hang on a second, I've found, here we go. Let's try that. Okay. I know it's the eternal struggle with, with internet and uh, bandwidth and Zoom and every other aspect of our virtual world. Okay, hang on, this is weird. Okay, I am in some kind of weird loop. Um, yeah, I, I think it's, um, it may be an internet connection or um, it looks like something internally in, in your Zoom that's having an issue. Um, okay. so Should I log doing, out and log, yeah, leave and log, log in? Okay. And maybe you can have um, Pat go ahead and speak and then we will return back to yours, Carol. Okay, um, Carol, you can also email me your slides and I can advance them for you because so far our internet here at the reserve, unlike just about anywhere else, um, has seemed to be okay. Okay. Um, so right, I'm going to do my apologies. Yeah. Oh, no 
that's okay. I think you're in, I, I would be surprised to find anybody on this call who has not had some sort of Zoom blip at any point in time. So Carol, if you wanna log out and see if you can log back in, we will try to get her um, back on the call to hang out with us. Um, in the meantime, we're just gonna um, go to our next speaker. Um, so Pat Regan is a, let me pull up all of my blurbs here. He has been trying to grow native plants since he was a child in Western Washington. And now after 36 years of identifying in the, them in the field and growing them in nurseries from San Diego to Carmel, he is killing a lot less of them. And I love that because I just had to pull out two dead plants from the garden today. So it does happen. You're not alone. Um, with that, Pat, if you would like to go ahead and share your screen and take us away. Thank you. Um, so unfortunately, I was loving the idea of tagging on to the backside of plant communities and the segue between each of the first three is, is perfect. Um, I have so many comments that I want to make about everything that the others have already said, but I need to stick to my topic. Um, one of the things that happens, you see all these beautiful photographs. You see what it's like to have uh, a house in the woods where you're surrounded by nature's bounty, or you have the opportunity to rescue plants from the Arboretum at UCSC where you have uh, amazing propagation going on. So the things that are chucked out there are things that you know you're gonna have some fun with. But So I began uh, growing California native plants when I started working at a nature center in San Diego County in 1984. And the nature center was actually um, a former um, horse uh, pasture barn setup that had, um, well, decades of horse manure and um, a really nice setting in the middle of the coastal sage scrub down there in San Diego County. And they said, we're going to turn this into a nature center and we want you to landscape it. And I thought, I have no idea where I'm going to find the plants to landscape this with. And um, I, I hate to admit this, but I literally got to the point where after we first got started, I would sneak out at night during the winter, during rainstorms and go up into the hills because this, this was a former cattle ranch as well. And I would go up in places where the, the habitat hadn't been destroyed and I would dig up the plants that I wanted to put into the nature center. And I would come back during the rainstorm and I would put them into cans and try to get them sturdy enough over time that they would have new roots forming in the cans and then I could start landscaping with them. And at that time, um, I thought, boy, I really wish there was a resource where I could find somebody who was already doing this because I killed many of the plants, even though I thought I was doing the right thing, getting them in the middle of the winter. I wasn't taking them off somebody else's property. I was taking them from property that I lived on and worked on. And uh, I began to do some searching around and, and found a couple places, um, a native plant nursery down in Southern San Diego County in National City that was run by a local botanist down there. And I found one up in the, the boonies of San Luis Obispo County called Las Palitas Nursery. And at that time there was another brand new again even started in Orange County called Tree of Life Nursery. And I contacted all these people and I started developing relationships with them. And they would send me printed um, paper with their plant list on it. And I would go through and write out a, a, an order and I would fax it to them because the fax was really cool then. And uh, that is how I started getting contacts with really good native plant nurseries. Well, I learned a lot of painful lessons from that. In fact, having them come and look at the things that I was doing and having them walk around and say, you can't do that. You, you can't do that. You, you cannot do that. And it was painful, but um, it was good education. But now we have um, 
opportunities and particularly in the fact that we've gone through this last year and a half where we were told for the most part to stay home from your volunteer activities, stay home from your growing groups, stay home from your nurseries. And I discovered that I needed to understand how to use technology. And our Native Plant Society, the, the Monterey Bay chapter, we decided to suck it up. And last fall, we had our annual sale, which is always a big deal for us. We had it online and we worked with the state and actually the state managed, I think, eight or nine different chapters that did their sales online. And it was really painful because we had to literally develop all the information for the plants, find, I wanted to say steal, some of us stole photographs, um, to find the photographs that we knew were legal that we could use and, and put them up on the website and put up good enough information that people would look at it on their computer screen and go, I have to buy that. And so the process that I went through, uh, I learned a lot in a very short time. And I have been running a small nursery in my backyard for 10 years since I stopped running a nursery for a larger company. And it's an addiction that I cannot get away from. But I could not have people come and visit me at the house. I couldn't go out and do things. So I decided to do my own online nursery store. And in the process, I learned about a lot of other resources um, to kind of locate things that I wish I'd had when I was a younger, foolish, less foolish, no more foolish um, man when I was first uh, starting off with native plants. And one of those that has kind of exploded out of the gates in the last year and a half because of this uh, great need is Calflora. Um, and Calflora has been around for a while. It has gone through um, a, a number of different renditions, but it has been one that is more tied in with um, kind of the botany side of uh, our native flora more than the gardening side for a long time. And it has been uh, actually a source of information. I do field botany. I go out and look at sites. And um, one of the things that I do when I find unique plants is I have to record it for a variety of different reasons. But on Cal Flora, you can search for plants and literally look up the locations where those plants were found, the person who found it, the day they documented what was going on around it. On this screen right here is just a, a small list of names and things, but it is the most rich resource for botany, but it's now become a fantastic resource for people who are looking for native plants to garden with. And um, what I thought I would do is borrowing from the, the plant communities and knowing where the, the reserve is just east of the reserve in the sandy hills of the Pajaro Hills is um, on some of the ridge tops up there, you have a, a plant community that's known as, as Central Maritime Chaparral. Maritime Chaparral is influenced by the fog, influenced by the cool weather along the coast, and it has a really unique uh, group of plants that exist in it. One of my absolute favorites, and most plant people will throw out about 40 or 50 things that they'll say is my favorite, so you just have to bear with us, but um, a plant called Archistaphylus pajaroensis, and otherwise known as Pajaro manzanita. I fell in love with that plant when I was down in San Diego. I didn't, I didn't know where it was from. I first saw it, I, I couldn't believe the color on it in the middle of the summer. It had gray blue leaves. And then at the ends of every branch, this gold and orange and yellow from the new growth. It was stunning. And I thought that's got flowers on it. And it wasn't, it was just the new leaf. Well, had I known then what I know now, um, and this, if this were available, I would have said, okay, I'm gonna go find Archistaphylus pajaroensis. And you can literally, um, I'm trying to see what I'm doing here, look up the exact plant. And so if you're a, a, a habitat gardener and you live in Prunden and you wanna grow that plant, you can search, if I spell it correctly, 
for Arctostaphylus baharoensis. And there it is, it's the Pajaro manzanita. It's rare. In fact, it's really only found in, in South Monterey and up into Santa Cruz County, um, nowhere else on the planet. With this resource, I can go to both counties and literally look at maps that show where they were found. That helps me again as a botanist, but it also helps me if I was a person who is uh, thinking, gosh, I, I, I have this property that has this really sandy soil and uh, I can't scroll up here today. I can't reach that. Okay. Um, my my zoom in is is buried by Cooper spaces. So um, you can go down this list, see the people that documented this plant. Manzanita Park in Prunedale, spectacular place to go see native plants. You can see hooker eye, you can see Paharoensis, you can see some rare orchids, Yadens piperia, um, Monterey spineflower, a little tiny annual that's gorgeous and rare. Um, so this is gives you ideas for places to go look, but if we go back, we can also get to some of the even better information. Um, what this does is it links to two different um, resources that will give us nurseries that we can find the plants at. And one of those we've heard mentioned already, and that's Calscape. Calscape is now the baby of the, the California Native Plant Society and has become our one of our primary tools for really promoting people gardening with native plants. Another one of those is the California Native Plant Exchange. It's been around longer. It is not as um, flashy, but it still has some really useful information. And it has, oh gosh, the name director. Hey, let me close this box up. There we go. So um, there is a variety of different. Um, buttons and things to push on this to find out more about uh, particular plants. So I'm going to go in and search for, again, that Arctostaphus pajaroensis, and I'm just going to use Pajaro manzanita, its nickname. If you don't know the scientific name, you can get away with uh, nicknames, but I generally, for the most part, hate nicknames because everybody has a slightly different one for it. Um, but Pajaro Manzanita is pretty, oh, let's see. Uh, guess what? We're going to go with. Is it blue? So I should confess that this is about the third day that I've used this. Um, we're not doing it in common. Uh, I am much better with my fingers in the soil than on a keyboard. But once you get into this, I called it a rabbit hole the other day, the possibilities are endless for finding information. So here we have, we brought up um, Paharoensis. And now this provides um, a lot of the same information that we will see in Calscape, but in a slightly different format. It gives you um, a whole group of, of photographs, for example, um, not just from Cal Photos, but from people who put them on websites for nurseries, from people who put them on their whatever social media things. And you can kind of get a sense for what I was talking about earlier, that summer color on, this is the first one I found. This is a selection of Pajaro manzanita called Paradise. And it's not because it looks like it's a bird of paradise. It literally was found on Paradise Road in Prunedale, I guess it's actually even closer to the reserve, but um, the color on it is incredible. So I wanna find this plant. I'm gonna go back from the pictures. And I'm gonna look at some other things. It gives me plant characteristics. This is what's amazing. Um, if you were to put in your address 
and I'm not sure which address it thinks it's using right now, you can compare where you are to what its actual average precipitation is in its wild form, how long the wet season is, what its temperature range is, what is the typical low temperature for it, what is the typical high temperature, um, its growing season, its hardiness zone. Now, this probably is taking it off my address from earlier because I'm in, in hardiness zone 9B in Carmel Valley. And it tells me that it has associated organisms, native bees, hummingbirds. And I can tell you from experience that they love that plant and they spend a lot of time on it. It's one of the, the best, it's one of the earliest bloomers every year. So when hummingbirds are migrating out, um, they're still stopping and getting fueled up on the Pajaro manzanita. Um, whereas the, the uh, epilobium canum, the California fuchsia is what they're gonna get uh, at the end of the run um, after they've come back and are now turning to head south again. But so this is, this is interesting information to a botanist that might not be as spectacular to you, but um, the elevation range is critical in terms of when you're on a site like I am frequently and I find a plant, well, okay, let's take the Empire Great up in Santa Cruz Mountains where somebody said, oh no, that's, that's, that's Pajaro Manzanita. Well, the one that looks like that, that has the same clasping leaves on it like this um, up in the Santa Cruz Mountains is called Arctostaphylus andersonii. See these leaves, they literally, they're, they're no connection except that it literally wraps around like earlobes on the, on the stem. So um, the information can be mind boggling as you start searching. Well, so now I wanna know who's gonna sell me this plant. And this is where this particular website tends to be a little um, dated. And it's kind of like books where there was a time when people would publish um, hardback books and so uh, hard soft cover books that would list, you know, resources for native plants. Nurseries, well, many of them don't survive. And so you find some that is, you know, that are long since gone, but there is a pretty good group here that are still with us. Um, let us look for Santa Cruz Native Revival. Okay, now Native Revival disappeared and has returned in kind of an online format. They don't have a brick and mortar place you can go to anymore, but they still sell plants. And apparently one of the plants that they grow is Arctostaphylus poharoensis. And here's one, well, that's a hybrid that has poharoensis in it. Um, Benenza, John Dorley's a stunning plant, by the way. Um, here we go, Warren Roberts. Now Warren Roberts is a little bit different than, than the one that I was hoping to find. It's a little bit shorter, a little bit bluer in the leaves and a little bit lighter color in the flowers. And I'm talking like a gardener here and not a botanist. Um, as a gardener, the, the color and the, the, the amazing transition that it goes through on the Selection Paradise is, is worth searching for. So I'm gonna go back from there and see who might have Paradise. Okay, so the other thing you look here, and some of these are wholesale only. Well, um, some of these wholesale places are the best places to find natives, and you can't walk in there and buy them, like in Watsonville, to walk into Suncrest Nursery, but you can go to their website and see retail sources, and Let's say I'm going to look for Monterey County. Bouquet Nursery in Salinas, Creekside Farms in Greenfield, Cypress Gardens in downtown Monterey, Delray Oaks, Drought Resistant Nursery. Great. All of these places, if you were in Monterey County and looking for that particular plant, you could go in and say, hey, you guys regularly get plants from Suncrest. Could you order me, if they have it available, um, Arctostaphylus pajaroensis uh, paradise. The difficulty still is availability and what we've learned 
particularly in the last year and a half, is that with shortages for supplies, with shortages of manpower, and the demand increasing for people wanting to grow native plants, um, availability has been difficult. And again, that's why I kept doing what I was doing here at home, and I have gotten to the point where I have um, put my little nursery on the website, and I have set myself up on Cowscape. So um, on, on the Cowscape site, you have a variety of different ways to find plants that either grow near you or find plants that you want because you have I'm one of my favorite websites called Plant Lust, um, where you look and say, I have to have that plant. Um, but there's some pretty fun things to do to find out. For example, let's use the Cowscape Garden Planner. I'm going to come up with a list that will be appropriate. Uh, let, let's just say Prunda. And I'm going to say that I want um, kind of a natural look. You, you can choose any of these others. HOA friendly. That means no natives, actually, but that's another story. Um, no, I know that some homeowners associations are getting more enlightened. But, so I'm going to just say partial sun. And I'm going to say I want it to be good pollinator habitat, and I want it to be good for bird watching. Water conservation is kind of is a natural, anyhow. They're resistant. I love the deer. I don't mind. So now it's going to bring up a list of plants that would be perfectly suitable and likely grow in Trundale. Well, there they are. Hooker's Manzanita, which is one of the companions to Pajaro Manzanita. Coyote bush. Now, I love the fact that two of those other speakers mentioned this. This is a plant that gets zero respect. Um, I've lived on ranches for long periods of time in my years here in California, and, and cattlemen are not big fans of coyote bush. In fact, they would like to see it wiped out because where coyote bush pioneers and fills in area and kind of starts shifting back to shrublands and sage scrub and, and even some uh, um, brain lock. Uh, chaparral, uh, coyote bush is not good for grassland. It starts to fill in the grassland and cattlemen don't want coyote bush for their cows. They want grassland. But I've actually used it as a hedge. I created a hedge that went all the way around my vegetable garden with it and we shared it regularly and it was actually pretty pretty. Pretty 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 attractive. Fuchsia flowered gooseberry. Here's our bush monkey flower. Now it's interesting. Um, this has been through name changes that get frustrating. When I first started learning the plants of California, this was Diplicus orientalicus, and all the really succulent annuals and soft monkey flowers were mimulus. And then they said, no, they're all mimulus. And they said that the red ones in San Diego County and the orange ones in LA County and the soft peach ones up in Monterey County were all the same species. Uh, they finally gone backwards again on that, pulled it back out of Mimulus and it's back to Diplicus. But um, as was mentioned earlier, there have been people tinkering with this plant, some, sometimes by accident, sometimes intentional. Um, uh, Richard Persoff was a gentleman who lived um, up in the Bay Area for a while and then was actually down in um, Santa Cruz County for a while. He became just a fanatic for monkey flowers and he's the one that came up with uh, the group called the jelly bean series and the kids series and he would go out of his way to to cross these and then he would do everything he could to kill them which i never had any trouble with i could kill them really easily but he would not dump soil after a plant died he'd use the same soil again he would do everything he could to make them as tough and disease resistant as possible because he wanted to make them what we call gardener friendly, not garden friendly. He wanted to be, he wanted my wife to be able to go out and water the pot that they're in every day and still have monkey flowers throughout the summer. And my, my wife likes to water things and I always have to push her away from my nursery. But um, it's turned out to be um, a spectacular group of garden friendly plants 
but also um, still amazingly tough. And um, our native species and selections are, are really worth the effort, um, particularly as was mentioned, if you're in, a, in an interface with a wild space, you don't wanna start putting those jelly beans out there where they're gonna start crossing. And again, as a horticulturist, I think, ooh, what exciting possibilities, but that's, that's not, not a good thing. Sand mat manzanita is another one that's an excellent sort um, ground cover that's found only in Monterey County, nowhere else on the planet. It's primarily on the former Fort Orr and around the, the airport and things like that. But this list gives you um, a really awesome selection of plants that would be great to plant in Croondale. So, okay, let's go check out Sand mat manzanita. So this just to have back that, to Patrick, um, just for um, for keeping us uh, closer on, on or closer on time, um, you've got about three or four minutes. Okay, thank you. So um, now they're showing sand mat manzanita up in Santa Cruz and Watsonville. I would challenge that, but what it does come back to is how Calscape can be really useful for a person who's looking for plants. This little detail right here, Calscape is really up to date. So when you see this little thing, it says 11 nurseries carry this plant. And you bring up that list, it shows you a map of where they are. And I know a lot of gardeners that don't mind a road trip, although Southern Orange County might be a bit of a long one. Um, but most of them are concentrated in the Bay Area. We have Tree of Life Nursery, which is worth the road trip. Theodore Payne worth the road trip. Okay, so this guy, um, this is my little website and it has uh, all the plants that I grow and I try to grow stuff that is just here in, for the most part in Monterey County in the greater uh, Bay Area. Oh, I don't know how to use my own stuff now. And I, have collected in places that um, are near and dear to me, some friends, properties and things. I have a lot of friends that own ranches, but even for plants like this, the, the snapdragon, which is one of those sticky plants that you don't forget once you've got it all over your fingers or your pant leg. Um, just the process of going through using Calscape can bring you to a place that's close by. Calscape has, um, the general list, let's go back here. I promise you, okay, let's go that way then. Okay, so you can literally look for California nurseries. And that's that's a place where you can start the, in a sense, the journey of figuring out what you want. Um, and you can zoom in to an area and you know some of the best like we now know this little spot world famous one of the oldest native plant nurseries in california used to be over on the other side of the ridge and is now in essentially half moon bay um, they've been doing it for a long long time they have a really nice selection of, of natives a little on the pricey side but if you're looking to learn about plants, if you're looking to uh, just see some really spectacular, well-grown native plants, that's a great place to visit. And again, the bottom line is with the time that you've had to spend at home, there's ways to start planning your journeys out again. And that includes the hikes, that includes going to other people's gardens. But this is a great way between Calscape and Calflora to find places where you can find the plants um, that will be the photographs that you take and show to somebody else next fall. And with that, I will pass the microphone back. Right, thank you, Patrick. And definitely use all of these resources. The links will be in the resource page that we share with you at the end of tonight, but take advantage of them. There are indeed many, many, many very fun rabbit holes to go yes. down there. 
Um, all right, so I believe we have Carol back on our call here. Um, and I will go ahead and share my screen so that you all can um, see her presentation. So again, Carol's um, a UC Master Gardener, a major fan of pruning, and um, will be sharing today on um, plant communities and highlighting and understanding um, the plant communities in the Monterey Bay area. Okay. Um, all right, so we're gonna do this through your screen? Yeah, I'll go ahead and do that okay. and that way you don't risk any funkiness. Sounds good, okay. Um, hang on just a second. All right, I'm back. All right, um, next slide, please. I'm gonna be saying that to you a lot, so bear with me. All right, um, just keep going. I'll, well, if it's okay with you, I, we can just uh, start where I left off. You got it. Um, I, don't, I don't know that we saw these slides though. Oh, we uh, did, but okay. Yeah, just keep clicking because I have this animated and I think I'm hoping it will work on, yeah, there we go. So, um, and again, <laughs> mountains to uh, interior valleys, awesome. Okay, so start again. Plant communities help us uh, click, yeah, great. Make sense of, yeah, alrighty. Um, so make sense of the different physical arrangements of plants found in the wild, recognize the geological and climatic conditions where these arrangements thrive. And together these can give us a head start and um, successfully matching local native plants to these features and conditions in our gardens. Okay, next please. Okay, next, uh, making sense of vegetation. Okay, next please. All right, vegetation can form certain patterns based on how individual plant species adapt to the conditions of their environment and also to one another and to uh, soil microorganisms, insects, and wildlife that live or visit among them. Vegetation patterns can be described using different scales. So from larger regions like swaths of California to much smaller local areas like your side yard, where the region or area is homogenous in its features. Uh, so where the climate, the soil, the exposure, sun, shade, and so forth is comparable. Um, and so you can have broad vegetation categories like tree, shrub, or herb dominated landscapes. So, uh, you know, forests and woodlands would be examples of tree dominated um, areas. Um, uh, coastal scrub, chaparral would be an uh, example of a shrub dominated area. Grasslands, um, the four dunes uh, where you get the abronia species and so forth, those would be considered herb dominated areas because the tallest canopy, all right, um, in a forest is a tree and uh, shrubland is gonna be the scrub shrubs. And in an herb dominated, you know, it's gonna be some of those plants that are only growing maybe a foot above the ground. Um, and then you have finer vegetation types like plant communities. And then you have super fine vegetation types like plant community alliances and associations. Um, and then she, you can also um, just talk about vegetation patterns in terms of uh, geology and climate patterns, again, across a broad area of California or microclimates in our gardens. Okay, next click, please. All right, so patterns can be described using different scales. They can also be described using a, a combination of features um, that consistently characterize a, a particular geology and climate, a particular topography. Are you in North Slope, uh, South Slope? Are you in the canyon? Are you on the ridge top? Or, you, or, or back to vegetation groups of separate plant species that aggregate together. Um, okay, so next slide, please. All right, so ecoregion maps. This, uh, these are done by the EPA. Uh, their criteria for making sense of vegetation, uh, for making sense of um, in the environment is across relatively large areas of land or water. They contain characteristic geographically distinct 
um, groups of natural communities, of natural plant communities and species. The biodiversity tends to be distinct from that of other ecoregions. And if you look at the checklist, uh, ecoregion three, which is what this is, you have like Central California coast, which is in orange. You, and then you've got all these other um, ecoregions in the state, okay? Uh, Central California coast ranges and Central California coast uh, would be for most of us. Um, I'm not as familiar with San Benito County as I'd like to be. I don't know if they kind of verge on the Great Valley. So it's possible if you're like on an edge between two eco regions, you, know, you might want to take a look at the one that's, you know, right next door to you. Click again, please. And again, okay, cool. Um, so this is ecoregion three for the state. Um, the coast range is the red uh, along uh, Northern California down to uh, Santa Cruz. And then uh, you have Central California, foothills and coastal mountains. Those are the green shaded areas in our area. Uh, please click again, Ariel. Okay, so this uh, new one is ecoregion system four and note that for the coast range, we've got all these, you know, sub categories. And so now what used to be red, we've got all these different colors going on. So it's a little bit of a finer um, look at the different environments in our state. Um, so next slide, please. Okay, so making sense of vegetation at the plant community level, um, Plant communities are a group of plant species that live together and are linked together by their effects on one another and their responses to the environment they share. Uh, typically, the plant uh, species that co-occur in a plant community show a definite association or affinity with each other. Um, just a plant community concept, it's what we were all taught in our science classes. Uh, plant community, the term and the concept attempts to describe and explain how and why different plant species consistently uh, come together at particular locations and also tries to account for how these groups change over time. And just like there is a classification system for plant, animal and other species, there is a classification system for vegetation. And to be honest, I've been grappling with this uh, since uh, last fall and I'm you know, still have a lot to learn and a lot to straighten out. But um, plant community um, in the science community has caused a lot of confusion and healthy debate, but its underlying goal of providing an organized way to understand our surroundings is still really helpful. Um, when you're looking at a landscape, first break it down into broad categories. So when you're on a hike, um, are you in a tree dominated area or a shrub or herb dominated landscape? And then you can look at the species and which species um, are uh, seem to be the lead species at the tree level, at the shrub level, at the uh, herbaceous level. And dominant just means which plants form um, the particular level of the canopy, the overstory. If there's an understory, uh, Um, just take a look at which plants are forming the majority of the main layers of the understory. Um, okay, so uh, click again, please, Ariel. Thank you. Uh, for many reasons, correlating what we see around us to a description of a plant community uh, can get really fuzzy. Um, so if you look at this photo of this oak woodland in the left background, there's a eucalyptus grove forest. I was stunned to find that eucalyptus, a eucalyptus forest is an actual uh, plant community. Uh, and then in the foreground, this was taken from um, Cabrillo's horticulture campus. And in the foreground, I think if I recall right, it's like a mixed evergreen on the campus itself. So you've got three different things going on. And uh, this is all trees. But you can see the oak woodland is very open. The eucalyptus forest is very dense. There's not a lot of opening uh, between the trees. And then the mixed evergreen forest, um, I really honestly don't have much to say about that at the moment. We're gonna get right into that. 
Um, and then the other thing with the, uh, the other part of the fuzziness with plant communities, it's like you're correlating what you see to what you might read about. But then if you're at the edge of a community or you're in a transition zone between communities, there's, it's really cool because there's a lot of possibility for plants to come in and maybe they like it, maybe they don't. And for your garden, it's a really cool uh, opportunity to experiment and um, make hybrid plant communities. So bring in plants that are compatible with uh, uh, the conditions that um, the major plants um, in the plant community that you're modeling like. Um, and then the other issue is that um, as you look at books, there are different names. And as research, uh, as we add, as scientists add to the research and their understanding, um, some of the plant community names may change. They may um, have their um, descriptions updated in some ways. So there's something that you can find on um, various uh, websites that are called crosswalks. And all this is, it just, says what the um, current plant name is for it and then what it used to be known by. So you can always backtrack, there's ways to do that. All right, next slide, please. All right, so we have about 67 plant communities in our area and it kind of varies depending on how you count. I am um, looked at vegetation maps for the counties and uh, some books, um, uh, Marianne Matthews book of the plants of Monterey County. There's a um, Santa Cruz uh, Native Plant Society did one for Santa Cruz County. And so I pulled the plant communities from those and put them in an Excel spreadsheet. So this is what I came up with. Um, again, it's not written in stone. This is just my approximation of what we've got. So we have um, about between the, the forest and the woodlands are the tree dominated um, communities that we have. And so Riparian may be, uh, some of those may be shrubland, some of those may be woodland, and it was hard from their names to kind of figure out what was going on. But bottom line, about half um, of the number of veget different vegetation types we have in our Tri-County area is, um, um, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. About half of the vegetation types are tree dominated, forgive me for that. And then about a quarter are about shrub dominated. Okay, next uh, click please. Okay, so um, most of us live like near six or seven communities. So um, most of us live near three um, forest communities, redwood, closed cone, mixed evergreen, um, two woodlands, central oak and riparian, and a couple shrubland uh, communities or shrub dominated communities, coastal sage scrub, maritime chaparral. In the middle, um, it just kind of shows some of the definitions. So in a forest, the tree, covers over 60% uh, of the canopy over the ground and the canopies overlap. For woodland, it's 10 to 60% uh, of the canopy covers the ground. And there's a lot of open space between the stands of trees as we saw in the oak woodland and the canopies tend not to overlap. The trees space themselves um, a little bit uh, apart from one another. Okay, next uh, slide please, or next click please. All right, among these six community, uh, communities combined as uh, Karen and Jackie and Pat have talked about, there's a lot of variety. So there's a lot of choices for your garden. Next click, please. Within any single community or in transitional areas between communities, a lot of nuances exist. Transition, transitions may be gradual or abrupt, but again, I just wanna encourage people, go native. There's a lot of cool choices that um, you'll enjoy aesthetically and uh, functionally for your garden. Next slide, please. Okay, so plant communities in our area, I'm just kind of doing a minor detour. This is from the, um, the California man, um, I'm gonna get this, why am I blanking out? The Manual of California Vegetation from CNPS, okay? And so you can search on a species, it will give you a list of plant communities what they are giving you is actually a list of alliances. And again, alliances are just variations of plant communities. Again, this is just, um, um, you can think of it as just kind of a conceptual framework, but just, it's okay to think of it as 
plant communities for our garden purposes. Um, so it will tell you characteristic species um, in the community. It will not list every species in the community, just the ones that are dominant. So there may be other things in the community that are consistently there, but they, they're not considered to be uh, characteristic of the community. It will show you the habitats. Um, and then this other habitat alliance and community groupings, this is where the synonyms come in that you'll find in uh, older science books or in other resources, or that are the basis for other um, um, databases such as uh, the wildlife habitat relationships relationships system uh, database, which um, tells you about what uh, tells you about plant communities and it's basically from the wildlife perspective. And I'll have a sample of that um, later on. Next slide, please. Okay, these next few slides, um, I just want to give a thank you to Master Gardener Mandy Salm. Uh, she and I partnered together on a presentation for um, our Master Gardener chapter of Man Monterey and Santa Cruz counties. And she graciously uh, um, gave me the okay to use her photos and um, her content to um, give you a, a much more thumbnail presentation of uh, some of our the communities where we live. So I just wanted to thank her for that. So next click, please. Okay, so this is coastal sage scrub. As we go through these, I'm just going to focus on the um, physical conditions, not on the plant species. So again, uh, on the left is coastal sage scrub, on the right is maritime chaparral. Um, the architecture, you can see that the plants are dense, they're close to one another, and they're low growing. The soils tend to be poor, they're either acidic or sandy or thin and rocky with underlying clay or rock. Um, the plants differ broadly in that um, what grows depends on fire, moisture, wind, exposure, and soil. Both communities are drought adapted. However, maritime chaparral is fire adapted, coastal sage scrub is not. Next slide, please. Okay, so we're in the redwood forest and uh, with the forest communities, they have a lot of their physical conditions are they have in common. So after I get through the redwood forest, I'll just highlight the differences of the our other two forests. But basically, they're all dense. They're all really vertical, um, and overall, they require cool, moist days from the marine layer influence, with some sunny days. And all three of these communities have a diversity of overstory and understory plant uh, species that can support a variety of wildlife. So for red, the redwood forest, um, it requires more precipitation than the other two forest types that we'll look at in a second. Um, part shade, filtered light. Uh, next click, please. And unique feature, they're uh, red, that's okay. Um, so we'll go to the closed cone pine forest. Okay, back again. Uh, redwood trees are long lived due to the tannic acids in their bark and heartwood that, um, uh, protect them from pathogens and insects. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so now we're in the closed cone pine forest. Click again, please. So again, uh, again, all the same. Uh, the presence of coast live oaks is what distinguishes the closed cone pine forest from the redwood and the mixed evergreen. Uh, the presence of live oaks is variable and it depends on soil and climate conditions. Uh, the plants are fire dependent and um, they rely on infrequent but predictable fires, at least in the his, uh, in past history. Okay, uh, next click, please. Monterey pines are the fastest growing species of pine trees and their cones um, rely on fire events to open and regenerate, although they will open um, over time in, on warm days. And um, you'll see that uh, various spots around town. All right, mixed evergreen forest. Um, Okay, um, again, same deal as the other two forests, but um, one, their architecture, they have leafy, leafy trees, fewer conifers than the other two forests. So it has a softer, more horizontal look and the understory is more dense than you would find in a redwood and closed cone pine, for, uh, pine forest. 
Um, the main thing, though, that I want to point out is that they are found between redwood forest and oak woodlands. So they're in this kind of intermediate zone where they don't get as much precipitation as the other two forests, but they're not quite as dry as the oak woodlands. And then when you look and see the plants, the plants are favoring north facing slopes or canyon bottoms. So when you think about it, north facing slopes don't get hit with the sun that south and west facing exposures do. So they can control, the plants can control their moisture a little bit, manage their moisture levels a little bit better. And then if you're at a canyon bottom, water's flowing downhill. So again, it's another way for these species to survive. All right, next um, click and we'll move on because I think I already said that. Okay, central oak woodland. Again, you can see the patchiness um, in the hills. You can also see um, how their pattern that they angle down, you know, certain slopes consistently across the hills. Um, so open patchy tree coverage is sparser than the forest communities, uh, hilly areas in the interior fire adapted. Next slide, please. Oh, um, okay. Um, keep going. I'll just add the central oak uh, woodland is a huge important breeding area for wildlife. Okay, so now we're in the riparian woodland. The riparian areas can be so many different things. They can be vertical and open, dense and complex. Uh, tree coverage is sparser than in forest communities. The regular presence of water is the main um, defining feature for them. And I just want to clarify, it's um, moving water, not standing water like um, environments where there are lakes or vernal pools or ponds. So it's moving water, rivers, streams, and so forth. And the soils are very nutrient rich. And um, next click, please. It has the greatest diversity and productivity of flora and fauna of our six plant communities. Okay, okay so what it means to mimic a plant community, it's native plant species, plus vegetation architecture, the layering, the vertical layering of plants. The goal is not to re replicate a local plant community in your garden, but if you want to, by all means. Um, the goal is to use native plants that are naturally found together and to arrange them in ways that create functional self-sustaining habitat. Next click, okay, stop. Interactions between plants, wildlife, and the physical environment initiate and sustain numerous natural cycles that benefit wildland, our gardens, and us. Next click, please. When we borrow from local plant communities, we um, become more active participants in the natural cycles that these, uh, this combination of geology, plant, and wildlife create. Okay, next click, please. Okay, click. All right, so uh, plants and animals, they need energy, shelter, perpetuation of the species. Um, wildlife offers nutrients in terms of uh, some of the things Jackie and Karen were talking about earlier, the microorganisms in the soil that exchange um, access to moisture or nutrients in exchange for carbon and other food sources, energy sources from the plant roots, uh, protection from pests and herbivores uh, by being really wonderful beneficial insects that go after our pest insects, birds as well, uh, that go after pest insects, pollination, seed transport, plants offer in return, food, uh, protection from predators, shelter, and nesting sites. Next slide, please. Okay, so habitat spaces can be vertical or horizontal, permanent or ephemeral. Next click, please. Okay, ground level plant litter, debris, uh, bare soil for burrows and tunnels. Next click, please. So on the left, ground floor. On the right, um, a buckwheat plant, uh, Ariogonum parvifolium, dune or cliff buckwheat, host to the Smith's blue butterfly. And that gets to be about maybe a foot and a half high. Next click, please. And then you have vertical stories and taller shrubs and at different levels within tree canopies. So uh, this is a hummingbird. It's in a, a Ceanothus shrub that is aging out and also um, got hit by the drought. Um, and that plant is about maybe eight feet high. Next click, please. And then you go even higher up in the canopy. And so in this case, trees in a huge nest, uh, probably about 15, 20 feet up. And of course, you know, you can go as high. Um, as the tree will support a nest. 
or food or what have you. Next slide, please. Okay, so architecture garden analogs. On the left is coastal scrub, um, Artemisia, some Bacchus, monkey flower. On the right is a garden, a residential garden, and they did a similar thing. They're doing coastal sage scrub with uh, sage, I'm not sure what species that is, poppies, and again, the density, uh, the same height. Next slide, please. Okay, now in the previous example, uh, even, you know, the residential garden was modeling a coastal scrub community in, 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 in that um, properties place, they were doing coastal sage scrub. Here, I'm just wanting to give an example. Let's say you want a thicket, maybe you want to provide cover for wildlife or you want to screen against uh, to, for privacy from your neighbor. In the wild, it looks you know, pretty messy and hard to maintain and so forth, but you can do something similar. So on the right, uh, Creek Dogwood forms a really lovely um, uh, privacy screen from the neighbors next door. Um, and then there are some low plants uh, that were planted for some variety. Notice too that the slope that the dogwood is on is somewhat, uh, I'm sorry, is a slope. And then to the, in the, uh, right side, there's a dry stream bed that's kind of U-shaped, so when it rains, the water comes down into the dry stream bed, which then carries it away from um, the house. Next slide, please. Okay, these are some garden examples. This is a garden in Marina that was on the Marina Tree and Garden Club show, uh, or sorry, Marina Tree and Garden Club tour several years ago. I fell in love with this garden. One of the things I wanted to point out, um, are the wood and rock and boulder features throughout this garden. I mean, sorry, throughout this garden. And it's a great place for lizards to hang out, birds to explore or perch on. It's just awesome. I think it was it's Salvia leucophila uh, that's um, uh, spilling over it. You have Artemisia um, on this terrace on the um, right-hand side of this photo. They planted some manzanita and coyote brush. And on the right, um, you can see the manzanita and then I think a little bit of uh, coyote brush, just a part of it is showing uh, in the foreground. I love the rough hewn look of this. When I was in this garden, I felt like I was in a state or county park. It's just really lovely. Um, I think it was still somewhat um, young at this point because I would imagine uh, that the owners have probably filled in some of these um, spaces with some more plants. And you can see on this one on the right, there's like a iris or lily um, that's in the front as well. So these nice little touches and accents. Okay. This is another example, um, but it's a little bit more refined. It's not formal. It's really relaxed and really peaceful and really lovely, but it's not as rough hewn. So on the right, you've got um, manzanita, and then you've got a variety of a few different um, lower plants with some really nice textures to offset the manzanita. This garden is also young, and so I imagine the mulched areas have filled in somewhat with some other plants. There's a nice boulder that's, you know, just sets off the entrance to that path really beautifully. On the right-hand side, you um, imagine a driveway right in front of that photo. So every time the owners leave or return, They've got this lovely vignette view of this Western redbud that was pruned like a tree against the redwood that's across the path. And so when the redbud is in its growing season, instead of the pink blooms, you'll see the round, lighter green leaves against the more feathery and darker foliage of the redwood. So it's really cool. So if you want to do something more structured, you can. It will work. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so depending on your particular site conditions, you may find yourself drawing from just one plant community or two or three. Select the one that best matches each area of your garden. Select the dominant species you like. Usually these will tend to be your garden's foundation species. And then select supplemental species that will be compatible. Uh, you wanna make sure that plants are hydrozone, that they need the same water requirement, the same sun. Uh, so just make sure that you don't plant a full sun 
plant in a shade bed, make sure that their water needs are comparable and so forth. Remember, please, to combine plants, I mean, uh, non-living features, boulders, logs, into different aesthetic groupings, use vertical layers, um, make sure you have enough space available for each plant at its mature size. So don't be bothered by having open spaces if you're starting, if you have a bed that you want to redo and you're starting from scratch, it will fill in, give it time. The problem with, uh, that often happens is that people don't like those empty spaces and so they plant things too close together and then when you go to prune them it's an ongoing nightmare instead of a joy and also pruning as uh, Jackie mentioned is can be disruptive to wildlife that's looking for food or for nesting site or nesting materials. Aim to approximate, build up your garden's resilience, resiliency over time so have plants that uh, bloom at different times throughout the year, have plants that can be backups so that if you lose a plant to a frost or what have you, there'll be another plant that will survive it that can take over the function and just allow your garden to evolve. Let wildlife bring in uh, species uh, when they deposit seeds, engage with a lighter touch and just enjoy it. Next slide, please. Okay, um, I'm just gonna, go through the blitz through this really quickly. Um, Calflora allows you to search by plant communities, which is a really cool feature. Next click, please. It also allows you to, on a map, to actually zoom in and draw a polygon over the area. So you can do that with your property and then find out what's going on there. And then on the right-hand side, you know, there's all this technical information that you can get that can be helpful. So pH can be helpful, texture can be helpful. Although if you're in an area where soil was brought in from another place that um, may not always be, uh, what's in the databases is based on uh, soils that developed naturally geologically over thousands and thousands of years. So um, always ground truth um, your property to know what's going on. And then you can also get really cool climate data, annual precipitation, um, what the highs, what the lows are. Uh, next, um, yeah, go ahead, next please. Uh, and then the, Calif the CNPS Manual of California Vegetation. Next slide, please. Okay, so you can search, um, the only difference between advanced search and map search is that map search has the same criteria as advanced search, but it provides that eco region map so you can select, okay, I just want to look at communities in the central coast or in the coast ranges. Okay, so you can plug in a species by um, its scientific or common name. And you can also search uh, for that plant in a tree dominated or shrub dominated or an herbaceous dominated alliance, okay? And when you um, click on search, you'll get a lot of, you may get like five results or you may get tons of results. In this uh, example, I searched on Arctostaphylus hookeri and 50 results in fact were returned. It was just kind of a weird coincidence. And you can see there's all these different alliances that this plant occurs in. And uh, next slide, please. Arctostaphylus Rookeri uh, is, I guess, a provisional alliance. So I guess it's uh, getting its own alliance. Uh, it, again, the characteristic species uh, are listed and I already uh, went over that slide. So in the interest of time, next slide, please. Okay, Calscape, um, you can search by one criteria at a time. Next slide, please. Or you can search by multiple criteria. Next slide, please. Uh, and then the results are really, really cool. So they tell you about the plants. They give you all the basic gardening information. Um, you can use Calscape to fine tune, you know, to see really what's going on at your site. But, um, and then Calscape, um, you know, can give you a specific general, but you can go super fine if you want on Calflora. Um, and it talks about the wildlife. Next click, please. And it gives you, you know, the cultural uh, needs uh, for sun, moisture, and so forth. 
and uh, companion plants and so forth. Next slide, please. And at this point, uh, this is the California Wildlife Habitats Relationship System. You can search by habitat and a lot of habitat names have the same names as plant communities. So don't let that throw you. Um, and note this uh, link here to life history accounts and range maps. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is the habitat types that uh, this database has. They have tree, shrub, herbaceous, developed, uh, ag and urban, and they have non-vegetated sites like barrens where no vegetation is. It's natural, but imagine, let's say a rocky uh, sea cliff where a bird might nest, but there's no vegetation growing there. Next slide, please. And then if you clicked on the, um, that little link that I showed you, you'll get a window and the, the wildlife uh, system only does uh, vertebrates. So amphibians, reptiles, birds and mammals, no insects. Next, go ahead, next click. And then each of those four categories has a drop down list. So if you wanna search for a particular species, you can. And then it gives you the choice to look at a range map um, and a description of the species, which is really in depth and Guidebooks are limited because of space, but they're more in depth in guidebooks. So you can find out what does wildlife in my uh, area eat and maybe I might wanna plant that. Next slide, please. Take a breather, next slide. <laughs> uh, references again, I just wanna thank Mandy uh, again for sh um, allowing me to share her materials. Next slide, please. And thank you uh, again to Ariel for inviting me to the panel and for uh, all of you in the audience joining us this evening. And that's it for me. Absolutely. And thank you for bearing with the, the uh, bandwidth virtual issues that always seem to plague us even two years into a virtual world. Thank you, Carol. Um, yeah, thank you for giving me a little bit extra time. <laughs> absolutely. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing. And I know um, we are uh, a little bit over time, um, but I know that there were really good conversations happening. People seemed really interested in some of the different things that were going to be shared. Um, and this is being recorded. So we will be able to share all of this with anybody if you need to pop off, if you need to get going to something, um, you can watch the recording afterward. Um, but I would like to open it up to a couple of questions. Um, our speakers have been uh, really wonderful in offering to help me over the next week as well, answer any questions that we weren't able to get to. So um, if you had a question and it doesn't come up during this Q&A and you really want it answered, um, know that in my follow-up email um, about a week from now with the recording and the additional resources, um, you will hopefully have your question answered then. Um, but with that, I want to pick up a couple of thoughts that came up um, for our panel speakers. Um, one, which is one that actually really resonates with me as an amateur gardener, but um, I'm sure relates as well to, to experienced gardeners, is the idea of what defines part shade versus full sun. Um, and likewise, they had mentioned, you know, what, what defines water tolerant? Um, so I'd be curious to hear from you all, uh, maybe, you know, in just a minute each, uh, what for you, what are, what are those definitions? What do you think of when you see a plant that says partial sun? What do you imagine planting it under or near or around? Are you taking that? Taking that? I'll let you go ahead. I'll let you Pat. go ahead, Pat. What just happened? What just happened? Oh, okay. I think somehow you have an echo. echo. Why don't you try it there? Can you hear me? I can hear you, Karen. I can't quite hear Patrick. I think there might be something wrong with the mic. 
for me, part sun would be like dappled shade under a tree or only morning sun and not midday or afternoon sun. But it's kind of a flexible term, I think. I think it also depends upon where you are. Um, oh, yes. If you're in Carmel, um, part sun is like dark shade out here where I am in East Carmel Valley. Um, but I think of it as, as a matter of what you just said, Karen, that it's um, morning sun that would be you know, on the east side of your house or something that is going to provide some good growing sun, but isn't going to create the heat that would come in the, in the west facing region of the property, wherever you're planting later in the afternoon. Full sun, I think of as having at least six hours of direct sun during the day. And that would be, again, switching over to the south side or the west side of a, a planting area. Yeah. I don't think I have anything to add to, to, to that. I think that's right. Part sun, part shade. Part shade seems different to me. It's more shade loving plants that don't like deep shade. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm sure there's moisture content that comes with that as well. Yeah, that's um, true. Jackie, well, I'd like to direct a question towards you simply because you were the one talking about fire escaping. We had a lot of questions come in asking um, primarily, what are the more flammable plants to, again, maybe steer away from or keep much further away from your house? So if you have a couple of key flammables um, that are definitely the, the ones to maybe not put right next to the house, because um, you had that list of oh. your most virtuous plants or the plants that are least less flammable, what are the ones that are more flammable that somebody might want to steer away from? Well, how, uh, certainly anything with needles rather than leaves. Um, pine trees, they're not good, you know, but you wouldn't have, hopefully wouldn't have them near your house anyway. Um, mm. Chemise, anything with a, a lot of odor and kind of oily, um, the sap that's very smelly, or it has a strong odor, often plants that are fragrant, which is unfortunate. <laughs> Not all plants that are fragrant, but um, uh, they have terpenes and oils in them. Um, what was the other one? Uh, well, there's one I was going to mention. Acacia, palm trees are very flammable. Um, yeah, I mean, Again, it comes back down to plant characteristics and um, looking for a well irrigated plant that doesn't have volatile oil, oils in it and um, doesn't have fine texture. So rather than looking at specific plants, Shanice mm -hmm. is definitely not good. Salvias are not good. They're very fragrant. They are kind of oily. They get very dry and brittle. Um, you can rejuvenate them, and I love them, and I risk it with some salvias, uh, even, even though I have local native salvias. They don't seem to bother the black, black sage that's native here, so I take a risk. <laughs> but, but they're definitely anything that gets dried. Uh, you know, you might, it might look green on top, but you look underneath. And um, it's it's all dry and twiggy. You know that's not a good that's not a good option. Thank you. Um, another question that we had come in, and I'm just trying to find it. This question came in actually for Carol. Um, what is your take on using cultivars versus straight species if you're not gardening at the wildland urban interface? So, Jackie, you had mentioned how you at that at that interface, you don't want to use the cultivars as frequently because they can disrupt the local gene pool. Um, but if you are working outside of that wildland urban interface, maybe you're in more of something like a garden in an urban area like Karen's um, or like mine. And especially I think in the context of if you're trying to maybe create a plant community, what's your take on using the cultivars? Are they 
maybe useful? Do they work with creating a plant community? Or is that going to um, disrupt maybe the alliances that they had already built up? Oh, and I do, I'm gonna have you unmute. I think I had. Sorry about that. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah, sure. okay. Um, I'm not quite sure how to answer that from um, its effects on other plants. I don't know if there's research on that yet. Research into cultivars is really, really fascinating, but um, it's started a few years ago. And so there's um, some interesting studies in on the wildlife perspective, like the cultivar, cultivar flowers, they may be a different color that will not attract insects or maybe they won't have the line on the petals to guide the bees in, right? Um, sometimes the nectar, maybe a cultivar will produce more nectar or less nectar than the parent species. And then you have to think about, well, what's the nutritional content of that nectar and could that throw some things off? So um, I'm sorry to say that my answer to that is I really don't know and I don't know um, I, I would think in a garden setting, it wouldn't be a big issue. It's not like uh, the plants are gonna fight it out or duke it out or anything like that. And I know that's not what's being asked in the question, but I don't think uh, it would be something to particularly worry about, particularly too with Karen's experience with uh, the monkey flowers. So um, that's all I have to say about that. Yeah, and I'd open up that that question about, you know, the the maybe, broaden that question to what is our panel's take on the benefits or the pros and the negatives of working with cultivars and, and growing cultivars? Well, I certainly have plenty of cultivars in my small garden, but I also have species as well. But I'm far enough from any natural area. I don't have to worry, I don't think, about polluting you know, about interbreeding with the actual species and disrupting that, which I don't know, since I have such a small space and it's so public, I just want, actually what I do a lot of is outreach to people just walking by because I'm out puttering in my garden a lot. And I'm certain that I've gotten a number of people to consider planting native plants that would have never done it because they go, oh my gosh, your garden's so beautiful. And I go, yeah, and it's all California natives. And they're like, wow. And it's like their eyes are opened. Mm -hmm. and, and, and like I said, since I'm pretty far from any native area, blocks and blocks, it's like, I don't think it's dangerous. And I get lots of insects, but who knows what I would get if I had only species, maybe more, maybe not. I don't know. Can I add something? Absolutely. Um, I, I, it's interesting when, when we look at the, even the term cultivar, um, how we assign it to the full spectrum of plants that we took a cutting from a wild plant and cloned it, and would keep using that same clone to produce additional clones. So genetically, they're identical to the plant that was in the wild, but we're not changing anything about what it offers in terms of nectar, what it offers in terms of even its ability to cross with other plants. But virtually every plant that we choose, even for restoration, we're influencing the decision. We're not going to the hardest place to find the seed. We're usually going to the easiest place to find the seed where we stop along the roadside. So we're collecting uh, we're, we're controlling, in a sense, the creation of plant uh, lists or plant collections that are going into an area that we're calling that's restored. Well, if you're gathering seed, yes, it's sexually reproduced. So there's, there's that, the, the dynamic of the, the gene flow. But um, I, I think we have to be careful, like the difference between Richard Persoff's monkey flowers and like a, a cultivar like the Arctostaphylus pajarensis, <clears throat> excuse me, paradise, which literally was just a cutting taken from a shrub that was found in the wild. Um, if you were to take that that cutting and plant it, 
in Prunedale, in that area where it, it came from, it's still going to have the same ability to create a new genetic flow when it gets pollinated by a bee that's been on some other native Baharawensis right near there. So I think it's possible. One of the concerns that I usually have isn't so much um, the cultivar, is it's going into areas like we have some huge um, developments here in Carmel Valley that are supposedly all natural and, and they use just native plants. Well, they take species from Sonoma County and they drop them in on the actual interface with the wild. And you know, in time, we're gonna start finding hybrids because they're not using the, the, the same species that were there when they started clearing the lots. But, so I think there's a broad spectrum of the potential for hybridization and swamping a gene pool and things like that. I think some species are a lot more inclined to it than others, but I really feel like, particularly when we're talking about urban areas, suburban areas where people are literally going back and trying to put some life back, period, um, that using cultivars is, is a perfectly valid way to do that. Yeah, and I, I wanna real quick jump off of what you said there because we had one thing that I learned through using Calscape and deciding what plants were gonna go out into our habitat gardens, um, I immediately saw our yellow bush lupin just burst out. It grew like maybe four feet in three months. And, you know, from my perspective, that's great. That's awesome. I want it to be big and beautiful. And I immediately had people saying, hey, isn't that an invasive species? And I got real nervous and thought, oh, did I plant? And I looked it up and it is native, but only to the range that we're in right now. So apparently yellow bush lupin, which is a beautiful plant, um, which does grow naturally out in the, the coastal habitats here is not historically native to Northern California and has actually posed an issue in Northern California where people have planted it and it is now overgrowing things and taking over because it doesn't have, just like any invasive plant, it doesn't have the natural ways that it was kept in control. And so it's important to look into, you know, what is the plant that I'm getting and what is its history? What is its range? And to think about, you know, if you're getting a plant um, from a nursery that's farther away from you, or if you're visiting somewhere and you're picking one up, think about where it came from and, and look up a little bit of its natural range so that hopefully you're not bringing something in that is then going to potentially be invasive and, and cause an invasion that you didn't mean to. There was an example of that. Go ahead, Jackie. I saw your hand up. Go ahead. Well, I think, <clears throat> yes, it's a good point that natives can be invasive out of their range. Um, and it's a good point that many things called cultivars are actually selections. And the naming is very, um, the naming is very difficult. Um, a cultivar is a, is a trademarked plant. You are not allowed to grow it for resale if you don't have the license to grow it. Is that not right, Patrick? Well, it, it still has to have a copyright. And many native plant yeah. people have bothered with that for decades. And now they're starting to do that. Right. So that's, that's kind of a, a legalistic term. But some of the cultivars, just like wild roses, have got nothing to do with you know your double garden blooming roses because of horticultural selection and breeding, this is starting to happen with the native plants. And yeah. it can affect their fitness for their ecological niche, which many of us want to um, have them for. Um, if you breed for one thing, you might lose another, um, like Carol was saying, you know, and sometimes, you know, pollinators can't get in or whatever. Um, but plant selections, I think, are, are great. Those are just particularly attractive plants that somebody spotted, and they're reproducing them, cloning them. Of course, you don't want to put a vast number of clones out in one place, but in a garden, it's perfectly fine. So, I think right. the difference between restoration and, and uh, gardening needs to be clarified in many cases, because the plants that you yeah. would suggest for restoration really should come from that local area. The plants Absolutely. that you want to garden with, some people do 
I'm forgetting there's a new term that people are using, like a hyper native um, that still want to have my native garden. I want it to just be the plants from my neighborhood. So you can do that, but that's that's really kind of trying to create a restoration. And, and when you're doing restoration work, you should be random with your selection of seed from the area, and you should be able to just do that group of plants there. Yeah, that's definitely an important distinction. Did you want to add something, Carol? Um, no, I don't think oh, I do okay. have anything I really to add. Light up, so I wasn't okay. sure. No, no, no. It was just um, something to do with my computer. Sorry about that. And and I will say, like again, some of these things um, can be debated for for a whole nother presentation topic. Um, we were talking the other day during a practice run about the idea that um, when you ask whether something is native, if you ask, is yarrow native to California? Well, yes, it is one species, but there is, that is a group of plants and there are a whole bunch of them that are native to Europe and other areas. And if you got that type of yarrow, it would not be native to here. Same with, I know Yerba Buena is kind of a common name that gets put on a lot of plants that I see. And not all of them are the Yerba Buena that grows in our local uh, mixed evergreen forest here. Um, so understanding plant names. And then I think what Patrick and Jackie were both talking about is that idea of understanding what you are hoping to get out of your garden space. Is your goal restoration? Is it firescaping? Is it creating um, specific habitat or a specific pollinator or species? Um, or is it you know, gardening and curating in a way that's going to entice people into it? Um, I know getting my mom some beautiful, but admittedly cultivar species of yarrow and sticky monkey flower were what inspired her to dive deeper into native plants and gardening with native plants. So they can, you know, they do have pros and cons to all of this. Um, I wanted to wrap up with just one last question. Um, somebody had mentioned earlier in our presentation um, and they were uh, listening to Karen. So I'll have her go first on the answer to this one. Um, but they were asking about the mounds that you had created. And her question had been specific to the fact that um, she is in an area with the opposite problem. She has just sand, sandy soil. Um, and I think that speaks to this larger question of how do you look at, um, as a gardener and as a native gardener, um, how do you look at prepping the soil and figuring out um, what you're going to plant based off your soil types. And then if you have some recommendations for those sandy soiled people, um, those would probably be appreciated too. Well, those sandy soiled people are so lucky. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the most wonderful, special ecosystem. And I think the issues there are not building mounds to get plant crowns up out of the water. It's having plants survive their first couple of years in those fast draining soils. So it's more like that. Um, yeah. Uh, anyway, yeah, you have to look and, and that would be some kind of uh, a, the, the sand hill environments with the very sandy soils. A person who's lucky enough to live there would I would severely recommend get some expert advice on what would be ecologically the best thing to plant because they're really rare and special ecosystems. It's not like in town with what I'm sure I'm on an ex agricultural soil here, you know, it's really different. Mm -hmm. so, Do others have thoughts about um, that they'd want to share about sandy soils or just better understanding and identifying the soil around you? Well, when I think of sandy soil, I think you're either on an old dune or along a river. And I'm along a river where I have alluvial sand and I, I can't get it to hold water. Yeah, that's right. So, so I do a lot of mulching and I confess I'm forcing it to become a different um, 
plant community than what it was originally. It was a broad floodplain from the Carmel River, and it was probably a lot of uh, willows and sycamores and box elder and things like that. And, and I'm trying to make it take the plants that I want it to grow and take care of them. And some of my favorites from Southern California, I struggle. They literally need more water because the drainage is so rapid. Wow. But, yeah. but you have, when you start looking into particularly what Carol was talking about, when you start choosing plants that have that uh, characteristic, I mean, again, some of the riparian plants, some of the the plants that would be found if you're out closer to the coast in dunes, you have a pretty good selection of plants to work with. And you don't have to be a stubborn pest like I am and fight it. You can figure out what <laughs> would grow there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'd like to add something too. Yeah. Um, don't fight your geology. Um, don't fight your <laughs> climate. Um, <laughs> I've seen people I've, um, at various gardening events and they want to plant, let's say, um, a coastal scrub plant, but they've got a very muddy um, backyard or muddy area in their backyard, but they love this particular plant and they want to see it from their, um, let's say their living room or see it from their deck. And all I can say is, you know, in, the, in a very exaggerated way, you know, if you live in a riparian area, don't plant a coastal scrub plant. If you live in a coastal scrub area, don't uh, plant a riparian plant. It's just not going to work, or you're going to be putting a lot of work into trying to um, make something that you just can't uh, make something happen that you just can't. So respect your geology, respect your climate. With respect to sand, yeah, I, all I can do is is second what uh, Jackie and um, Pat were saying about just adding organic matter. I mean, that's really all you can do. And the sad thing is even the organic matter will kind of decompose and drain through. So you're yeah. constantly replenishing it. Um, the other thing you could consider uh, would be container gardening or building like a raised bed with soil that is suitable for the plant that you want to do and right. somehow uh, integrating that into your garden. So that could be another uh, way to, to go about it. But I understand that for most of your garden, when you have sandy soil, it's a huge issue. Absolutely. All right, well, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap up our night um, since we're getting quite late into the evening. And I know that many of us, myself included, could probably ask a lot of questions for a lot of time. Um, I want to first add into the chat here. Um, and again, I will also share this link. We have everybody's email from Zoom. So we will follow up with folks after this event with a recording. Um, we are also preserving all of the resources that our presenters so kindly shared on a page on our website. So I have just linked that into the chat. Um, and again, it will be in the follow-up email as well. But on that event page, you will now find um, lots of different resources from speakers, as well as a lot of the links that we mentioned in the presentation. So definitely check back to that, use it as a resource. I also want to extend to everybody to come use Preserve and our site as a resource. We have knowledgeable people here um, and are, we are happy to talk about some of the ways we've worked with our areas and especially that difference between gardening and curating versus restoration as well as where they blend. And I also invite folks to reach out to California Native Society the local UC Master Gardeners chapter for Santa Cruz and Monterey, um, as well as the UC SCI Arboretum, which all of our presenters today are affiliated with in one shape or form. All of those are great resources. They can be your network. They can um, be a great shoulder to cry on if your plants did not make it, which is going to happen. There are gonna be casualties. You have to get over that. Um, speaking as somebody who is still getting over the casualties from that, my year out in the garden. Um, and with that, I would like to extend a huge thank you to our presenters for speaking tonight. This was fantastic. This will be a great resource to share with others. Um, 
thank you, thank you for the work that you do in your gardens, whether they are urban or wild face. Um, and thank you to everybody else for attending tonight. And I look forward to seeing more and more natives popping up around the Mont Ibe area. Thanks, Ariel. Thank you, Ariel. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks Good so much. Everybody.